How do you manage, how do you monitor for relapse in your patients with lymphoblastic lymphoma? So the t typical T lymphoblastic lymphoma patient. Uh, well, that's more dealing with that's uh, usually with the. I mean, obviously by ex obviously if somebody comes with a lymph node, it would biopsy it. I mean, I don't think you have to do once somebody's in remission. I don't think you have to do serial PET scans every couple of months to see whether they're staying in remission. And I think the lymphoma field, once you're in remission, you, uh, my understanding is you don't keep doing restaging PET scans over and over again. It's variable, depending on who you ask. Um, but uh, meaning uh, there is still a lot of overuse of PET scans. That's really more what I'm trying to... to because do. I think if you catch it maybe a little bit, I don't think for lymphoma, if you catch it a little bit earlier versus when you can feel a palpable lymph node, I don't think it's going to make all that much difference to the outcome of the patient. I mean, for during initial induction and consolidation, I usually do assess them uh, at the time of the bone marrow biopsy. So if I'm assessing their bone marrow, I usually do get pets, uh, the PET scan during that time if there was a detectable disease that I'm following. I think during maintenance portion of it, it's the kind of there's no standardization, but you know, the, during the first two years, I usually either alternate CT or PET scan every six months or so, twice a year that I'll monitor them by imaging. Uh, bone marrow, we typically do for every three months during that time, uh, the first two years during the maintenance and every six months there after that. So you know, the, I, I think there comes the value that how much imaging is too much. So uh, we settled on every six months during the maintenance, but you know, whether that is not too much, and as you said, if it's detectable, it's like what, what do you do for the small bits of diseases appearing? Um, what do you do with the information? But part of it is so some assurance there too, and then it, it, it kind of not checking kind of the too infrequently, but um, that's kind of what we've been doing at MSK. Mark, do you think there might be an advantage for NGS peripheral blood assessments in these patients? I think there could be. I honestly don't know a lot of data in that particular area. I don't know if you do. Um, it's, it would make sense to to be able to utilize that approach, uh, but I don't know if there's good data about that. Yeah. What about uh, timed MRD negativity? How do you incorporate that into your practice? You know, the patient that gets into MRD negativity after one cycle versus two or three. Do you change your approach to those patients, Bijal? Yes. Uh, and so if someone has persistent MRD, for example, after consolidation, I get very, very worried. And, and I'm talking about even very, very low levels by NGS. And I start thinking about intensifying therapy where and how I can. And that's going to be dependent on how the patient is coming to me. So maybe that means incorporating nilarabine into their frontline um, regimen. If they're coming to me on hyper CVAD. With T cell disease. With T cell right. disease. Uh, if they're coming to me, you know, on hyper CVAD, then maybe that means incorporating pegasparaginase on the hyper CVAD backbone, mm -hmm. uh, and we've done that as well. But the the bottom line is, I'm thinking very, very hard about what to do for these patients and following those patients very, very closely. So this is the end of consolidation persistent MRD. If they're MRD positive after induction but clear it after consolidation. That's a much harder question to answer, and now I'm going back to the original genotype, and this is again why we try to sequence our patients um, frontline. If I'm seeing high-risk features that I don't like, I'm more apt to take that patient to an allogeneic transplant. If I see what looks like a more benign, uh, you know, um, genotype, I'm going to make something up, CDKN2A2B, uh, without much else in the way of, of mutations. I might say, okay, then, you know, this is someone I'll repeat an MRD assessment on at the end of therapy, just to make sure that the MRD remains uh, negative uh, before making any big decisions. And if it does come back positive, now I have my blend and, and other approaches that I can think about in that context. But I don't want to pretend I have the answers. This is uh, really a, an institutionally driven approach, and, and I'd be curious to see what others, are, hear what others are doing. I mean, the early response, I mean, from the pediatric data, if you respond to preface steroid in the day 14, I think we know there's a good prognostic indicator, at least borrowing from the data from the pediatric. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the kinetics are important. So uh, if you get early, then it's 
kind of assuring that you know that I'm kind of more optimist or, or optimistic in the sense that may these patients may not be as in a high, not high risk and therefore may not you know, uh, need a LO transplant. So we uh, often have the conversation with the patients. If they are using pediatric inspired regimen after induction one, which is usually by day 28 to day 30, and if you repeat a bone marrow biopsy, and they're MRD positive, um, if the MRD negative good, but if they're MRD positive and then they move on to induction phase two, or they, uh, and then they are, and which is about six to eight weeks of a chemotherapy, and after that, which is now about 12 to 16 weeks, if they're po uh, negative. So I think that's the part that they're the, the hard, on the hard part for me as well. Just because they're converted negative, are they now good um, because they were positive induction phase one and day 28 but not negative at three uh, kind of three months after are those good as minus minus patients meaning initially MRD negative after induction one and the negative I don't know answer to that we're looking into the own database of the pediatric inspired study whether early response and I generally think those are assuring but if you convert after induction two with a you know slightly different regimen then what should I do with it in, uh, those patients? And I think then, I think we have to factor into all the other factors of genotypes, molecular features, and so forth to make a decision that in, if, if I, I take a similar approach, if I, don't, if I see something that I don't like and that I consider to be a higher risk, or con then I uh, will be much more aggressive in changing therapy or to allogeneic transplant. If not, then kind of staying on the current regimen. I think it's a very important point that we shouldn't rely on MRD alone. Um, uh, we need to look at the overall picture, the genetics in particular. I think those two, in my mind, the genetics, whether it be the cytogenetics or the molecular, uh, plus the MRD assessment, yeah. uh, uh, need to be factored into how your subsequent management is going to go.